Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Dark Souls Dissected. Today's episode is going to be all about multiplayer time limits. Unique in the series to Dark Souls 2, they made it so that online players only have a limited amount of time in Host's world, before they're kicked out. This has some interesting design implications that I think are mostly positive, and the best thing to come out of this was the small white sign soapstone, which is something that would have been nice to have in later titles. Let's start with the time limits that are set for co-op. By default, the small white sign soapstone gives you 500 seconds, while the full-sized soapstone gives you 4000 seconds. This is the difference between roughly 8.5 minutes versus over an hour. So while it's still possible to run out of time using the full-sized white sign soapstone, it's not a common occurrence. But with the small soapstone, not only is it possible, but unless you run straight to the boss, it's expected that you'll be kicked out before the host finishes the level. For all forms of co-op, the time running out is signified by a darkening of the phantom's appearance. At 2 minutes remaining, it'll look like this, and at 1 minute remaining, it'll dim down to this. Now, there are a couple things that can affect the timer's length, and I'll talk about those in a second, but why bother adding a form of co-op that's so short? Isn't the point of co-op to help a host clear level and defeat the boss? This is where the small white sign soapstone shines as a unique spin on the series' approach to co-op. They basically made an item that can be used for bite-sized co-op sessions. You can still use it to help with a boss if you really want, perhaps by placing your sign directly outside of a boss room, but there's a couple things that make not doing that desirable as well. The first is that having your time run out isn't considered a failure. Quite the opposite. Running out of time as a co-op summon gives you the same rewards as if you killed the boss. You'll get your humanity back if you were hollow, you'll get your smooth and silky stone or token of fidelity or whatever, Really, the only difference is not getting the boss's souls. The second thing that makes this alluring is that the small white signs are still available to players who've killed their boss. Most of From Software's Soulsborne games have been pretty bad at this. The main purpose of multiplayer from their perspective is that it's there to help or hinder players who are trying to clear a level. But once the boss is defeated, they seem to not see the value in allowing any more multiplayer activity for the host, and so they usually just shut it off entirely. Some of the biggest strides in addressing this have been made by other developers when they get their hands on these games. Dark Souls Remastered allowed players to interact with Red Signs and Dragon Signs after a boss was dead, understanding that non-invasive PvP should still be an option regardless. And the Demon Souls remake re-enables multiplayer after a boss is dead if the host is using a password. Because why not? But From Software did experiment with this idea first in Dark Souls 2, and it seems to go hand in hand with the short timer of the small soapstone. The reason they're okay with kicking you out before getting to the boss is the same reason they allow its use without a boss, because its main purpose is not for helping with the boss. It's to drop in for a short session to help the host with a chunk of the level. I find this to be a pretty neat idea. Even if it's not going to be the most popular form of co-op, it's nice to have that option. Maybe the host just missed an item in the middle of the level and they'd like to go back there after the boss. Maybe there's a specific mini-boss or a group of tougher enemies the host would like help with, but didn't plan on fighting the boss at all. Something that would be very likely to happen in a level like the Dragonary. Instead of having to kick your summon out when you're done, the player summoned by the small soapstone can fulfill their duty just by helping you out with random tasks in the middle of a level. That's pretty cool. This is something that would be welcome in a game like Elden Ring, where if you're a host who's focused on exploration more than anything else, co-op as it is really isn't a great fit for that especially in the overworld. While a lot of players are perfectly happy to help a host do whatever, there is sort of an implicit understanding that you should be making your way to the boss eventually. The host might even be seen as wasting their summon's time if they never make it there, and kicking them out might even be considered rude. I almost feel compelled to apologize for this. Now, I do come bearing a new discovery, which is that using the name engraved ring increases the amount of time you have. For any form of multiplayer that it works with, it increases the length of the timer by 50%. So for co-op, this increases the amount of time you have to 750 seconds or 6000 seconds, depending on which soapstone you use. Well, I can't claim to be the first person to discover this, 
Some modders in the community, like Lord Rodai, already knew about it. And special thanks go to him for helping find and identify the exact multipliers being used in the data. Okay, I see a bunch of multipliers here. Wait a second, uh, the time increase amount if you use the name engraved ring, is it like 50%? It's okay, it's inside uh, a param file. It's like bullet param stuff like that. I don't know which it is though. It's these numbers here. Yeah, it's a uh, network param for C5054 and 58. But there is a serious knowledge gap about this in the community. To this day, none of the wikis had anything to say about it, and I couldn't find any mention of it in forum discussions. I found just one comment on Fextra Life asking about this, and that's literally it. So shout out to Anonymous, you might have been one of the only people on the internet talking about this. So here we are, perhaps seven years too late, with some new information about the name engraved ring. Something that was understood by the community is that killing enemies in co-op also decreases the amount of time you have. The roughly eight and a half minutes you have as a shade, that's assuming you don't kill anything. But every enemy is worth a set amount of time, and generally speaking, tougher enemies are worth bigger chunks of time. I think this is a pretty neat idea overall, as it can sometimes give you a singular focus as a shade, where you know that you're there to really just help with a particular room or mini-boss in some cases. Although, you could also make the case that maybe those numbers were a little bit high in some places, ending your session almost comically fast. One particular location that comes to mind is the room with all of the Ruin Sentinels in Dranglet Castle. There's five of them there if the host opens all the doors, but they each subtract 96 seconds. Add that all together, and that's eight minutes shaved off your timer, on top of the time spent fighting them, and all of the stone soldiers being worth 10 seconds each as well. So, yeah. Summon Shades don't usually get to help clear this room in its entirety, and the numbers probably could have been balanced a bit better for situations like this. Even though the loss of time from killing enemies has always been understood by the community, I don't believe there was ever a concerted effort to review how much time each enemy is worth. It would take far too long to go over all of them now, but I'll link to a document I made that has it all listed out, and I'll review some examples for each duration of time that exists. To start with, enemies that spawn inside boss rooms are all set to not drain any time at all, which makes sense, you don't want your summon getting kicked out in the middle of a boss fight. But apart from some enemies that aren't worth any time at all, the least amount of time to be subtracted by any enemy is 6 seconds. This applies to enemies like boars, fume sorcerers, ashen warriors, and barrel carriers. Some of these enemies are a lot tougher than other early game mobs who remove more time than them, uh, indicating that they maybe didn't want shades getting kicked out super fast in the DLC. Or perhaps the lower time is a reflection of how enemy dense the DLC areas can be. There is a handful of enemies who drain 7 seconds, some of which include the Amana Aberrations, Poison Moths, Undead Supplicants, and even the giant corrosive Ant Queen. I was kind of surprised the ant was worth so little, but it doesn't fight back, so I guess that makes sense. I should also mention that there are some Basilisks that are only worth 7 seconds, the ones found in the Shrine of Amana. But enemies that are found in multiple areas tend to have their timers change depending on the location. I'll talk more about that a bit later, but just know that enemies like these Basilisks are often worth up to 12 seconds in other locations. At 8 seconds we have a few basic hollows, we also find the lowest value for some skeletons, crystal lizards, and even suspicious shadows. They're the most surprising thing to me here at this number, I figured they'd be worth a little more time compared to what they're grouped with. And even though most lesser hollows are worth 8 seconds, we have a pretty big outlier found in a variant exclusive to New Game Plus. That's worth 40 seconds instead. At 9 seconds, we have a few enemies like the Captive Undead, the Rampart Golem, Sonic the Hedgehog, really just a lot of enemies from this DLC in general. 9 seconds is also how much the cheapest Mimic is worth, but instead of climbing up to just 12 seconds, they have some variants that are worth 18 seconds and even 24 seconds, so they have a bit of a bigger range than usual. At 10 seconds, we have enemies like the Hollow Rogues, Stone Soldiers, Rupturing Undead, and Grave Wardens. We can also find a Black Phantom Stray Dog that isn't worth a bunch more time, so what we saw with the New Game Plus Hollow earlier isn't really a pattern we can trust in. Sometimes they're worth the same, Sometimes they're worth even less, for some reason. At 11 seconds, there's only two enemies in the entire game with this exact duration. It's the Butcher Phantom and Forlorn Invaders in the Shrine of Amana. 12 seconds, once again, is where a lot of the previous enemies with lesser values cap, 
depending on their location. But we'll also find enemies like the Mannequins, Goblins, and Falconers. We'll also find that Lord Seldora is set to 12 seconds. Just kind of a funny thing because he can't normally be reached in co-op. But just to prove that the timers of unreachable enemies are still functional, here we are using Cheat Engine to get there. Ranging from 13 to 15 seconds, there's a handful of enemies that are all different invaders, but who really cares about them? At 18 seconds, it's mostly invading phantoms in the DLC, but we also have the Pagan Tree. At 24 seconds, we have the Desert Sorceress of Dranglet Castle. I didn't mention them earlier, but they're another 12 second enemy when found in other areas, but they specifically get doubled in Dranglet Castle for some reason, along with the Mimic and some others. Now from here we should start having some regular NPCs pop up, but I'm going to skip over them since they're helpful in understanding what's happening between different areas, and just take a look at the tougher mobs who are starting to be worth more significant amounts of time. At 30 seconds, we have the Petrifying Statue Cluster. At 36 seconds, we have the Lindelt Clerics and Cyan Knights of the Shrine of Amana. At 40 seconds, we have the Vrangian Sailors, Ironclad Soldiers, and the Darkstalkers of No Man's Wharf. At 45 seconds, we have the Hunting Dogs and the Giant Acid Horn Beetle of Aldia's Keep. We also have the cheapest versions of the Hyde Knights, found in Hyde's Tower of Flame and the Sinner's Rise. At 48 seconds, we have the Torturers, which includes both the regular and Black Phantom versions, and also the Undead Jailers. At 50 seconds, we have the Lady of Witch and Cyan Knights of the Undead Crypt. Here we jump up to 60 seconds. A full minute is subtracted for most NPCs by default, but also this applies to enemies like the Claw Hollows, Iron Warriors, and Lion Warriors. At 72 seconds, we have the cheapest versions of the Ogre, Old Knight, and Dragon Rider, all found in the Shrine of Amana. At 80 seconds, we have just one enemy, the Flame Lizards in the Forest of Fallen Giants. At 90 seconds, we start seeing a full minute and a half, subtracted for enemies like the Dragon Skeleton, the Forgotten Giants of the Black Gulch, the Imperfect, Snowy Jabba the Hutt, and the cheapest version of the Giant Basilisk, and also everyone's favorite, the Frozen Reindeer. At 96 seconds, we have the Ruined Sentinels of Dranglet Castle, the cheapest version of the Artificial Undead, and a few variants of the Pursuer. The Pursuer, by the way, isn't worth any time in the Forest of Fallen Giants. Even if you encounter him early outside of his arena, it appears they didn't create a unique variant for that, and bosses don't subtract time. Also, something weird here with the Artificial Undead, but their New Game Plus variants are only worth half the amount of time. There's a couple enemies that do this, and it's a complete reversal from other Black Phantoms being worth more time, so there's that lack of consistency I mentioned earlier. At 100 seconds, we have the Shield Knights, Dragon Rider of the Undead Crypt, and surprisingly, Fendrick is set to this as well. I believe he's the only boss with a timer included. In our penultimate category, we have enemies that are worth 120 seconds, a whopping two full minutes. This applies to the most costly version of some enemies I already mentioned, like the Ogres, Artificial Undead, and Pursuer, but this also applies to the Mounted Overseers, Drake Keepers, Headless Vangarl, and a few more. And carrying on in the tradition of Dranglet Castle, randomly doubling the time of some enemies but not all, there's also an NPC in here worth 2 minutes instead of the usual 60 seconds. So this is the most costly player character-like NPC. We can add this to the evidence pile that Special New Game Plus enemies weren't handled with as much consistency. And then in our top category here, we're going to find more Dranglet Castle variants that also wind up here because of that double time thing. These enemies all subtract 240 seconds, 4 minutes. That's the Great Bow Alon Captain, Belfry Gargoyle, Old Knights, and the Executioner's Chariot's Horse. So if you're using the small soapstone, and the host is at the central castle bonfire, and they're trying to unlock the path to the looking glass knight, you shouldn't expect to make it very far with them. If you're not running past enemies, just a couple enemies in this loop can send you back home. Okay, now to get back to NPCs. Earlier I mentioned how most of them are worth 60 seconds by default, but also how that depends on the location. I find this interesting because it shows how the developers applied some area modifiers to this timer system but I should clarify that these area modifiers aren't something that's still in the data. The game in its current state isn't doing any math to determine how much time an enemy is worth. Instead, the exact amount of seconds is something that's individually set for every enemy variant, under something called enemy param. But we can still see that the numbers had to have gone through some processing earlier in development where they got modified in bulk, depending on the area. 
For example, if an NPC is worth 60 seconds in Majula, that same NPC will be worth only 50 seconds in the Undead Crypt, 48 seconds in Dranglet Castle, 45 seconds in Aldia's Keep, 40 seconds in the Forest of Fallen Giants, and all the way down to 36 seconds in the Shrine of Amana. If we turn these into percentages, it looks like this is probably how the timers were modified at some point previously. I don't know why I specifically chose NPCs to illustrate this, perhaps because with the bigger numbers involved and due to some of them reappearing in several areas, it's where I first noticed it. But if you go back and look at non-NPCs, it applies to most of them, too. Remember all those enemies whose largest timers were 12 seconds? If you apply these same calculations and round down to the nearest whole second, it explains why a basilisk is worth 12 seconds in the Shaded Woods, why it's 9 seconds in Aldia's Keep, and why it's 7 seconds in the Shrine of Amana. So yeah, this whole thing is something that was done kind of globally to the timers. Though bear in mind that it's not always consistent. Hands-on adjustments were made to a bunch of enemies as well. Stuff like the doubled values of some enemies in Dringlet Castle don't fit into this scheme, along with the Black Phantoms and a few others. But yeah, if you look over the spreadsheet and compare the timers based on location, you'll find what I found very quickly, and that it is true most of the time. I have to admit, I am a little confused by the area modifiers. The default or longest timer being applied to Majula at least makes sense to start with, as it's a hub without co-op, so they wouldn't need to change it. Seeing the values at 100% there and some other late game areas like the Iron Keep makes sense to me. Then if the idea was to make it so that weaker enemies are worth less time, generally, that perfectly explains why early game areas like the Forest of Fallen Giants and Hyde's Tower of Flame are near the bottom. And then, with places like the Lost Bastille and Huntsman's Cops being in the middle, that makes sense as well. But things start to fall apart if this was supposed to correlate to gameplay progression. Because what is the Shrine of Mana doing at the very bottom? Why is the Shaded Woods at 100% when Aldia's Keep is below that? It's well understood that Dark Souls 2 had to rearrange the areas pretty late into development, so I wonder if some of these not matching the expected progression is indicative of the shuffling of maps. Given the similar design elements to things betwixt, of being surrounded by water and having big distant trees, I wonder if the Shrine of Amana was considered an early game location. If not having been the tutorial itself, perhaps it'd be the first area you exit through. In the data, the Shrine of Amana is one of the earlier map numbers after all, despite being a later game location. If we continue to go by the map numbers, Aldia's Keep and the Dragon Area are earlier than the Shaded Woods as well. While I don't think all of the original map numbers strictly match the intended gameplay progression, our outliers in terms of area modifiers seem to align with this. I also wonder if the random doubled values of Dringlet Castle were an attempt to tweak the map into being the ultimate end game location at some point previously. It is where the game ends, after all. I should be clear that we really can't draw any firm conclusions from any of this, but at the very least, I think this might be additional evidence of the maps being shuffled around. Anyways, there's just one more thing worth mentioning about the timers in co-op. Boss fights. When the host enters a boss room, it freezes the timer for all of their co-op summons. Lesser mobs found inside boss rooms are also set to be worth zero seconds, ensuring your summon doesn't get kicked out early. At first, I thought this was redundant. After all, if the timer's frozen, then what does it matter what happens afterwards? But actually, no. The timer being frozen simply means it stops counting down, but time can be subtracted from it, and if it reaches or goes below zero, the co-op summon will still be kicked out. Under most normal circumstances, this isn't an issue, but it's not just a hypothetical situation, it can be exploited. Take this example where the host enters the Dragon Rider boss room. These enemies are outside the boss room, so they still subtract time. There's something really funny about me getting the duty fulfilled message and leaving like I was a good helper, but meanwhile the host is getting trashed and dies shortly after. Unlike co-op, running out the timer in PvP usually isn't considered a victory for anyone, and it's much more comparable to someone black crystalline out. There are some interesting quirks here, but I suppose we should tackle the general idea first. Should there be timers in PvP? I think I like it, but there are pros and cons to doing this, and I don't think there's an obvious answer. If you've played these games online long enough, you've probably experienced one of those invasions where someone runs off and disappears, and trying to find them becomes a huge waste of time. Most forms of PvP in Dark Souls 2 give you 10 to 15 minutes, which I think is perfectly reasonable. So if having an invader hide on you forever was annoying in other Souls games, you'll probably prefer how Dark Souls 2 handled it. I do appreciate all those ridiculous themed invasions in other Souls games, though, 
where the host pretends to be a painting guardian or silver knight, and watches the invader run around completely clueless. I think 15 minutes is still enough to work with to do something like that, but overall I think that would have been less a thing if Dark Souls 1 had timers. I feel like some viewers are going to bring up how players in Elden Ring did a bunch of hiding out of bounds for AFK farming and how that wasted players' time. And while annoying, I'm not sure exactly where that fits into this discussion. That's more of a tangential issue since that's the host doing the hiding and it's not like you could slap one of these multiplayer timers on a host. So I mentioned that most forms of PvP give the hostile phantom 10 to 15 minutes, but this is another area where the name engraved ring can sometimes expand the length of time. I find this interesting because the previous understanding was that the name engraved ring only did two things. It filtered summon signs and expanded soul memory ranges for co-op, but for PvP, since it didn't expand soul memory ranges, it was thought to only filter summon signs for these forms of PvP and do nothing else. However, now we can add lengthening the duration of the multiplayer session to the list. Anyways, I think it's also interesting to consider some of the outliers here. Though the Red Sign Soapstone gives you 15 minutes by default, the Dragon Eye gives you 25 minutes instead. Both being consensual forms of PvP, I wonder why the Dragon Eye was handled any differently. I'm not sure what about it suggests that the Phantom should have more time. And then Abyss PvP gets 30 minutes by default, and 45 minutes with the name engraved ring. The Abyss areas are much smaller than most levels in the game, so you wouldn't think that players would need any more time here. But after thinking about it, I think I understand where they were coming from. I think that developers figured that these aren't going to be levels where the invader really gets to hide, and it's supposed to be like this sort of gauntlet where the host fights through a bunch of player character like NPCs. They wanted invaders to feel like they were just adding another one of those NPCs in, so they wanted to force that encounter and wound up doubling the length of the invasion timer to help with that. Though they could have made the timer infinite in length if they really wanted, which is exactly what they did with Blue Spirits. Blue Spirits summoned to help a host via the Guardian Seal technically have unlimited time. They don't have a timer running at all, but they were summoned to help a host with an invader, and their presence is tied to that invader being there. So in the end, the Blue Spirit should have under 15 minutes at best. Now, I don't actually know what happens to a Blue Spirit if an invader is killed after a second invader shows up. Successful use of the Guardian Seal is pretty rare, and I couldn't tell you if the Infinite Timer means they get to stay in a host's world forever, if invaders keep showing up and there's always at least one present, or if just the first one dying kicks them out regardless. If you have evidence of what happens in that situation, please leave a comment below. I suppose I might as well mention that Mirror Squire invaders also get 15 minutes. This is just kind of an obscure detail that I don't think anyone's ever noticed, as it's very unlikely that both a host and invader have survived together that long during the boss fight. There is one final quirk to PvP involving timers that's really funny, and it can be encountered in the PvP arenas. Now, I know enough players have messed around for at least some of you to have witnessed a duel ending in a draw. It's not something that no one's ever seen. Two players go in and spam gestures the entire time, or whatever. A rare occurrence, sure, but it has happened before. But the specifics of what allows a draw are probably a lot weirder and more unfair than you realize. Behind the scenes, one player is actually considered a host and the other player is considered a summon. This isn't something you can tell based on appearance, since you both look the same. But whoever interacts with the statue first in their own game will be the host. Whoever finds them afterwards will be the summon. And just like other forms of multiplayer, the host does not get a timer while the summon does. Now you might be thinking, well that's no problem. When the timer runs out for the summon, the game could just end the match in a draw for both players, right? Well, maybe it could have, but it doesn't. The timers operate client-side, with only one packet being sent out at the start of a match to try and get them synced up. So as the host, I can see a summon's timer counting down in Cheat Engine, but I can't actually modify it on them to kick them out early because the player with the timer running is really the only one truly in control of it. The only reason the host gets a copy of the other player's timer is to help apply visual changes to that phantom's appearance as their time runs out, calculating it locally rather than requiring the other player to continuously send more data online about how long their timer is. So, when time runs out in a duel, it seems that the host is ignorant to the reason. The player who ran out of time can get a draw and gets nothing, while the host simultaneously gets a victory. It's not really a draw, and the player who gets the draw message is being lied to. This isn't exactly a problem since the vast, vast majority of fights here are going to end with someone dying or having more health, but it's also just really funny to me that a really basic implementation of their timer system is the reason they can have unfair, asymmetrical draw rulings in the arenas. 
That's the sort of classic from Software Jank we've all come to know and love by now. Before I finish this video, I should bring up one more oddity I encountered. In one testing session, I noticed that the timer counted faster than real time, roughly 15% faster. At first I thought this might have been a 60fps bug with Scholar of the Furson, but now I have no idea what caused it. I haven't been able to replicate it in other sessions on PC, and I also didn't encounter it in another test on PlayStation. So it's definitely not consistent and not a frame rate issue. Maybe something just went wrong with Cheat Engine somewhere? Anyways, I don't think this is something that really matters, but just bear in mind that there might be a bug or some rare occurrence that can cause the clock to run faster than it should. Again, I'd like to reiterate that the specifics of this timer system was something I've always wondered about since Dark Souls 2 was new, so it feels very satisfying to tie things up here and to finally have more specific information available. I've made a table on the Fex for Life wiki that has all of the timers listed out, and I've also begun adding the co-op subtraction values to individual enemies' pages. And if Wikidot gets its shit together, I'll probably add everything there, too. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in the petition from the previous video. When I made that video, I had no idea when the servers were coming back online, but they were back up only about 8 days later. So that might have not been enough time to catch their attention, if they were going to listen at all. So it's safe to say that the Majula Mansion chest is forever dead, and Scholar of the First Sin will never see an official release of the weapon reskins. I knew it was a long shot, but given the subject of the video, I was going to be very disappointed with myself if I didn't at least try, and it was very heartwarming to see all the enthusiasm and interest from everyone. I really enjoyed seeing all of the comments left on the petition, so thank you for that. But something I didn't really talk about in that previous video, because I didn't really want to talk about hacking or modding the game as a sort of baseline gesture while I was asking something of them, but I would like to clarify how you can still get the reskins. They're all in the game's files still. They can be traded among players online, and they're not flagged among the kind of items that'll get you soft banned. They're safe to use. Of course, you need to tread carefully if you're going to use outside tools. I can't guarantee that all methods for obtaining them are completely safe, but if you can find someone else who knows what they're doing, they can be gifted to you and simply receiving them from another player is without risk. I don't have any plans at the moment, but mass gifting events at future Return to Dranglix is something we should keep in mind as a possibility. I'd like to thank Fino the Fox, Carl Germ, Algae, and Ro. They all made appearances in this video and helped with testing, troubleshooting, or in other ways as well. And thanks to James I guess for additional testing help. Special thanks to Lord Radai for the reverse engineering demonstration, and also to Evan and Moonlight Ruin for listening to my questions and ramblings about Dark Souls 2 in general. If you'd like to support this video, please consider subscribing and doing all the usual stuff that helps. You can also support me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash illusorywall. An extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. Basileus, Gary Marshall, Kakaruma, Carl Germ, Kiko Abad, Chris, Lazy Tangent, Nashwan Azari, Nate Hines, Quinn Parsons, Ronax, The Majalis Duo, Zenatu, and Zelther. Thanks again for watching.